Matthew chapter 6, we'll be looking at verses 5 through 15, so it is a, a little more lengthy than what we're used to, but, but I want to keep the, the context and the flow together so that we have the idea of what Jesus is saying to us here on prayer. So I, I, I will not get as in-depth as I usually do because I just don't have the time to do so, so I apologize for that, though I've been enjoying doing that, but we'll get back to that as, as Jesus brings up certain topics. So we're going to talk about prayer. Prayer is not to be used to build up a reputation of self-righteousness, but only for the deep, intimate relationship with God himself. Now let me say that again because I know that was a lot. Prayer is not to be used to build a reputation of self-righteousness, but only for a deeper, intimate relationship with God. And that's the part I hope you would write down or underline. It is to build a deeper, intimate relationship with God. It is about communing with Him, speaking with Him, uh, spending that quality time with the Lord. Prayer is a little tool. And though which men desire to reach where they cannot bodily be in the presence of God himself. And that's what prayer does. It brings us into the presence of God Almighty himself. Hebrews gives us a picture of a throne room and how we as his children can go boldly into that throne room and request things from our Savior. And that is an awesome picture because it speaks about the fact that we have access to the Lord and that access will not be denied and that access will be will be granted to us in our petitions and pleas before the Lord. So prayer is a powerful thing and we have that tool to utilize in our lives. In the Old Testament there were four main words that referred to prayer. Uh, one was to pray, to literally just get out there and pray or to prayer in other words where you're saying a prayer of some sort or supplicate uh, supplicate meaning that, that you're on your knees and, and, and your heart is really bent over to the Lord and you're pleading with him in a sense. And that's the other word that, that is used in the Old Testament is to plead, to plead the Lord uh, on your behalf or the behalf of others. And so pleading from the heart that God would do something for us. Other verbs for asking and pleading are used to express praying include uh, things like crying out, you know, crying out unto the Lord or to call on the name of the Lord, or even just just to ask. Uh, there's a scripture in the New Testament that Paul tells us, I believe in 2 Corinthians 5, and it, it talks about how God takes a hold of a heart, and that heart is changed to uh, have a desire to see people saved, and, and in a sense, Paul says, we've become ambassadors for God. And he said, I've become an ambassador for God, as though God were pleading through me on your behalf. That's prayer. That is, that is a deep intimate prayer. That's a, that's a love that God has given Paul to plead on the behalf of others, uh, to intercede for them so that they would come to know Jesus Christ. Now, not all Christian prayer is, is based on the Lord's Prayer. Um, I'm sorry. Let me scratch that. All Christian prayer is based on the Lord's Prayer. And this morning we're going to be in the Lord's Prayer itself in, in part of this uh, sermon that Jesus gives to us. But we can find all prayer throughout the scriptures based upon the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father Prayer. Uh, its spirit is also guided by the prayer in the garden where, where Jesus was humbled uh, before the Father. And as he was praying, he prayed uh, for the cup to be removed, but then he submitted himself to the will of the Lord. And we also see another prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17. And so you can take those three major prayers together, and, and it is a very powerful prayer that we can use in our lives. In Matthew chapter 6, the study of the prayer appears to be on the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus spoke about the righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. And I think that's the underlying theme of chapter 5 through 7, is Jesus is trying to speak to his disciples and say, look, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the religious leaders that you know of, the Sadducees, the scribes, the Sanhedrin, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now that would blow you away at that time because you know that the religious leaders are the ones that went to the temple. They'd offered up sacrifice. They were in the Holy of Holies. These were the men that, that led the children of Israel. They were the men that were connected to God. And so in their minds, they're thinking, these are righteous men. 
These are the men of God. These are Levites. They have been set apart for God's work and purpose all the way from the time of, uh, of uh, the Levitical uh, tribes being separated there uh, among uh, Moses and so forth. Uh, so for us to exceed their righteousness, that's impossible. And that's what Jesus was trying to get, a, get, a, get at them to point out that it is impossible to exceed the righteousness uh, of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So the only way that it was possible it was possible through Jesus Christ himself by his blood and by his work. And so again, pointing to disciples that you can't do it on your own. And when you do do it, you need to make sure that you're doing it from your heart, your heart. Practicing one's own self-righteousness before men in order to be seen by them is what Jesus is teaching about in these prayers. Our prayers are not to be said so that men hear us, but that God hears us. Our prayers are not to be um, proclaimed before a group or an assembly so that they would see how well we speak or how eloquent our speech is or, or even to reveal our heart to them. But, but it is to direct towards God and that he would see our heart in our prayers. So Jesus is actually teaching against uh, public prayer and trying to impress others with it. And, and he is teaching about that in, in these next uh, studies, the alms, as we saw last week about giving, now about praying. Next week we're going to talk about fasting, but fasting with the right heart because God sees all things. So this morning's theme is the prayer the prayer. So let's let's go ahead and, and get into uh, the message this morning as Jesus moves to prayer. Look at verse 5. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrite, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corner of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Surely I say to you, they have their rewards. Notice the word for there in the second statement. Uh, when you pray, uh, you shall be like the hypocrites for. In other words, seeing that they love to pray standing is what he's saying there. They, they love to do that. You see them doing that. That is a part of their ritual of prayer. They stand there, which was their normal way of praying. They, they usually didn't get on their knees. They, they, they weren't uh, prostrated. They usually stood up and they prayed to to God in their prayer. These were the hypocrites. What is a hypocrite? Uh, the word itself is defined as a mask. It was used usually in drama, theatrical scenes, where they would take masks of different uh, features. Uh, if you wanted to portray anger, the actor would have an, a, a mask of anger or a mask of sadness, a mask of joy, a mask of excitement or a mask of surprise. And he would act out those scenes and so he'd put the mask on and you would see him as a, a, an angry individual or he'd put the other mask on and he'd be surprised or so forth. So that's the word hypocrite. You become a different person almost instantly. Jesus uses that word of these religious leaders that they are hypocrites because they want to be seen as something that they're not, but they have the appearance of being that by the other individuals. That is a hard thing to judge, isn't it? Whether a person is a hypocrite or not. Only God can judge that. And Jesus uses that word knowing the hearts of the religious leaders because they love to stand in the corners of the streets. They love to be seen by men. They love to be praised for their great prayers uh, in use of words and so forth. So these hypocrites, it says, they love to pray standing in the synagogues. And that is the churches there. Uh, in public where the other religious leaders are, where the community comes and sees, and so they love to wear their robes and their phylacteries and their boxes and be known as men of prayer or in the streets. The hypocrites are those religious leaders who pray with the wrong motives. It's not wrong to pray in the synagogues. It's not wrong to pray in the corner of the streets, by the way. That's not what he's saying. It's wrong to pray with the wrong motives. That's what he's saying. And, and so as we pray in a corporate gathering, that's not wrong. But there may be some here that are praying to be heard. Years ago, there was a, an individual that I knew, and he would oftentimes pray, and he'd pray pretty lengthy. And he'd also pray in the New King James language. And it was kind of interesting because 
Um, he would use the these and the thous and, and, and so forth. And you're going, why is he doing that? I didn't understand it. As though, as though he thought God only understood old King James language, you know? And that's just not true. God understands all languages, <laughs> no matter how educated you are or uneducated you are, because he hears the heart more than he hears the words itself. I mean, it, it, it's really lovely to hear honest prayers of believers. It, it really is when they're sincere. Now, oftentimes, they're the most short as prayers because they get right to the point. Uh, they don't know what to say, but their hearts are wanting to pray. And then as they pray, they, they kind of like, oh, Lord, Lord I'm, I don't know what to say, Lord, but I'm just, you know, uh, I love you, <laughs> you know, help me. You know, and you're going, wow, that just touches you because you're going, that's the heart compared to others. Like, oh, holy Father, God Almighty in heaven and earth who consumes all, you know, and you're going, oh boy, this guy's a prayer warrior. I mean, he's in tune with God, you know. I love those short little lovely prayers of honest uh, people. The religious guys were prayer warriors that would faithfully pray three times a day, like in the book of Daniel. They would pray at the third hour, and it's the sixth hour, and at the ninth hour, and they were out there in the streets, and they were in the synagogues, and they were praying. Nothing wrong with that. Again, it's the motive that Jesus is questioning. It's the motive. I'll pray all day. Many of the street preachers of the 1800s prayed for at least four to six hours before they even went out. Can you imagine that? Four to six hours. I, I think of, I've thought of that many, many years. I'd have to get up pretty early you know, before I start my day. And I start my day at sometimes 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. And, and, and six hours, you know, you're talking five, six, seven, eight. I wouldn't even start till nine or 10 o'clock to do anything. But they, they, they did some amazing things at that time. Their hearts were right. Their hearts were right, and God saw that. So nothing wrong with prayer. I, I wish I could pray more. These, these men here, though, had the wrong motive. Uh, they could not wait to get into the temple and pray in front of their disciples. And motives are important when we're praying. Very important to the Lord. These hypocrites are not seekers of God, but seekers of popularity. Don't seek to be popular. Don't seek to be known as a prayer warrior. Just pray to God and he'll see your heart. We should never pray with the intent of getting praise from men. Jesus said, as surely I say to you, they have their reward. Again, once again, in full. Just like with the gifts, if you have the wrong motive, you have your reward right there. The thank yous, the attaboys, the oh, you're so wonderful, you, your reward is in full. And if you have the wrong heart in prayer, then your reward there is in full also. But you, he says in verse 6, and that's emphatic there. Again, you, he's talking to you. He's talking to me. And he says, but you, and he's separating them from everyone else. You, I'm sure he probably pointed at a few people. You, when you pray, when you pray, and this is used twice. We'll see it again in verse 7. When you pray, and it is our duty to pray. We should be praying, uh, praying every day, every day to keep the demons away. I mean, definitely seeking the Lord, humbling ourselves before him. But Paul did say in Thessalonians 5.17 that we should pray without ceasing. There's nothing wrong with having a constant prayer life all day long. Um, when we're walking about doing whatever it is that we do, uh, whether it's just uh, getting ready in the morning, whether it's driving on the freeway, whether it's uh, at work itself, just constantly praying for people that come to mind. Uh, that's a prayer warrior. Uh, that's one that prays in secret because he's always praying unto the Lord. And that should be the attitude of us. He says, go into your room and when you have shut your door, pray to the Father or pray to your Father who is in the secret place. The room there. The word room there is not a prayer meeting uh, in a hall or a fellowship hall or, or some church. It is a private room where you meet God. Uh, the authorized version says closet. The New King James says room. Uh, one meaning can be secret place. It, it's a place where you're alone. It's a place that, that it's just you and God and nobody knows about this place. Or they may know about it and they may know that you go there to pray if it's in your home. I used to love praying in my office before it became a doghouse. Uh, <laughs> now the dogs are there and I can't go there. Um, but I'd love to sit at my couch and open up my Bible and I would pray there. And so now I have to go into the living room. 
and, and pray there. Uh, Jesus had secret places where he would pray. The Garden of Gethsemane, he'd go up to the mountain and he would just talk to his father, talk to his father. The, the secret of religion is religion in secret. That's McNeil said, the secret of religion is religion in secret because then it becomes relationship. It's important that we also find a quiet place so that we will have no distractions from listening to God. And that is so important. Distractions are just so awful, even in church itself. And that's why we try to keep distractions down. Going in and out, uh, sitting in the front, going back and coming back in the front and going again. And you know, we, we learn to find out who those people are and ask them to sit in the back if they need to do that for some health reason and, and so forth. But we need to keep distractions down. I don't know how many times people have come up and says, you said this, and I'm thinking, I don't remember saying that. I'm trying to figure it out. No, you didn't hear it because they were distracted and they heard something else, or they didn't hear something that I said, or they didn't hear the whole sentence because of distractions. Distractions can kill us. It's, causing, it's caused division, even, even in this church, because people are distracted by noises, and then they thought I said something, and I never said that. And I always encourage them, go back and listen to the tape and see if I said that or not distractions in our prayer life the phone ringing your cell phone with you looking at facebook while you're praying to god at the same time you know those are all distractions that we have you know and we need to put them aside and and really seek god and hope that he speaks to us personally i was speaking with a guy on on friday night and he's he's uh an assistant pastor and he was telling me a little bit about their denomination and um, about their their prayer and he was basically saying that these guys will lock themselves in rooms sometimes for hours and hours and hours and they will just pray and pray and pray until they until they hear from the lord and they want to hear what the lord would have to say to them and that's what jesus is is talking about Um, pray to your lord in a secret place where there's no distractions so that you can hear from god Shut that door, keep the noise outside, and just you and the Lord. He says in the next statement, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So our prayer should be directed to our Father in the name of Jesus. We don't have to pray with closed eyes. We don't have to fold our hands, which which I don't mind telling the kids, you know, fold your hands because we're going to pray. It's gonna te- it teaches them that it's prayer time and it's important. It doesn't mean that they have to continue to fold their hands until they're 30 years old. Oh yeah, dad's saying let's pray, so let's fold our hands. You know, you, you learn that it's prayer time. So you don't have to fold your hands, but it's nice to fold your hands. It's nice to kneel down, but you don't have to kneel down. Jesus uh, didn't prostrate himself in the garden at all. He was standing there. People might kneel down, and we see that in Acts chapter 21. Some sat down, 2 Samuel 7, 18. Uh, clearly, the position of our prayer is not that important. It's the position of our heart that is important before the Lord. Some people pray better walking. When I walk three times a week in the morning, I'm praying to the Lord as I'm walking around the block, you know, looking up at the beautiful sky and, and talking about his creation and just uh, talking to him. Prayer is our broken hearts poured out to a caring father who will reward us openly. That's what prayer is. God will reward us openly. Don't look for a reward from anyone else. Look for a reward from God. He wants to reward you. Not only will he reward you, but then that just deepens your relationship with him when he answers you because he becomes more real to you uh, when he does answer you and you kind of go, you do listen to me. You do hear me, really. Wow, this is great. You you mean you are there on the throne. You mean you really do exist. This isn't just another book that a bunch of people are reading together. No, no. When you take the time to seek him, he said, you'll find me. And if you seek me with all your heart, boy, I will pour my heart into you. And you will know that he's true, that he's true. And he really does want to reveal himself to you. And and, and oftentimes that comes in prayer. The most powerful times in my life have been from prayer and broken prayer. Prayer where you're just pouring yourself out to the Lord, not even knowing why, not even asking for anything, but just to be used or just to be in his presence or just to be um, available to whatever he wants. Just surrender to him and boy, he pours out into you. You I remember 
desiring the gift of tongues and, and praying for months. I wanted the gift. I wanted the gift. It's like a little kid, you know, and it's months before Christmas. I want to know what's that gift. Tell me what that is gift. And I see it there and I want it. I want it. I want it. And I was seeking the Lord that way in prayer. I want that gift, Lord. I really want it. And I would pray and I would sing and I would hope for it. And one day, there I was, just praying and singing. Okay, Lord, I want it. And all of a sudden, boom, spoken, spoken tongues. Because he answers you when you have a heart that really wants it, like a little kid. He's like a father, as Jesus said here. Your father will reward you in heaven. Look at verse 7. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do. I love that. The heathens is the Gentiles. Uh, he went from hypocrites, who were the religious leaders, and now he goes to Gentiles. <laughs> he says, don't be like the hypocrites, the religious leaders who should know better, but they literally put on a different face. Or like the Gentiles. Who's worse, Gentiles or hypocrites? I think hypocrites are worse than Gentiles in the eyes of God. The Gentiles are just heathens. They don't know better. They, it just comes natural. They're doing what they've learned all of their life. They grew up doing that stuff. But he goes, don't be like them who are repetitive because they're heathens. Uh, they worship idols and, and they think that their words being repeated over and over and over again that somehow their idol will answer their prayers. Uh, this word means to stammer, babble, to repeat some formula many, 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 many times. Uh, they did it with Baal. Uh, if you remember, uh, Elijah said, call on your God and they were there from morning till evening calling on their God, repeating these prayers over and over and nothing happened. And what did Elijah do? He, he said one simple prayer. God, just come and fall upon this fire in the altar and consume it. And poof, it just came. Because our God is real and their God isn't. And they think, yeah, if I just keep saying it over and over and over. Kind of these positive confession guys. You know, they tell you, wake up in the morning. Look in the mirror and say, you're successful. You're successful. You're a successful guy. You are successful. Look at you. You are a six. Yeah, you are a feel successful. Yeah, yeah. And you just keep repeating it. So you're walking out there. I'm a successful guy, you know. And then something happens. Oh, what happened there? Because <laughs> you're preaching to the mirror and you're preaching to your God, which is you because you see your reflection. Now, preach to God and his will be done for your life. Don't stammer, uh, even like in Ephesians with Diane as they worship the goddess Diana. Some of the rabbis during the Lord's time taught often repeated, repeated prayers were certain results and it's just not true. They weren't. This type of praying was an imitation of the heathens of the time who were noted for repetitive prayers. It seems that the further people become removed from a relationship with God, the more they put their trust on repeated forms of prayer. The more people are removed from a relationship with God, the more they put their faith and trust in their words and not in their God. And that's usually what happens. You know, we start praying more out of habit. We start praying just because that's what we're supposed to do. And there's no heart in that prayer whatsoever. Ecclesiastics says, do not be rash with your mouth. And let not your heart utter anything hastily before God for God is in heaven and you on earth therefore let your words be few for a dream comes through much activity and a fool's voice is known by his many words by his many words nothing wrong with repeating I mean there, there's nothing wrong at all with repeating and praying there's a wonderful parable in Luke chapter 18 I encourage you to read it it's the parable of the persistent widow 18 verses 1 on to verse 8. Eight little verses about this woman who wanted justice. And she goes to the judge. I want justice. And she went to the judge over and over. She was persistent. I want justice. Heartfelt. I need justice. I want you to give me justice. You're the judge. You have the authority. Over and over. And he finally says, look, I, I, I don't know God, nor do I fear God. But boy, I'm going to give you your justice because, boy, you are just so persistent. At least you hear every day pestering me. I'm going to give you what you want. You know, there's nothing wrong with repetitive prayers as long as the heart is right. The Talmud speaks of pious men who pray for nine hours a day. Uh, Paul said he prayed three times to the Father to remove this thorn and then he was submitted to the Lord's will at that time. 
Uh, there's nothing wrong with consistent and persistent prayer. It's the vain, vain, vain means worthless repetitions of prayer that Jesus is talking about. For they think that they will be heard for their many words, Jesus said. They are not heard for their many words. Jesus is not impressed with long prayers, but with a straightforward, short, and to the point prayer that comes from the heart. Therefore, let your words be few. Just say them forth from your heart unto the Lord. And he hears you. I oftentimes think about us in our relationships. And I have a tendency of doing this sometimes, but sometimes we can become pestering, right? Hey, did you take care of that thing? Oh, yeah, I'm going to take care of that. And then you come back a little. Hey, did you take care of that thing? Yeah. Did you take care of that thing? Like, how many times are you going to ask me? And we get like, ah. We'll see. God's the same way. It's like, how many times do you have to tell God? <laughs> you know? Hey, God, did you take care of that thing? I got it under control, Reuben. A little bit later. God, did you, you know, I need that thing. I know you do, Reuben. But God, did you get it? I heard you, Reuben. <laughs> yeah, I'm working on it. You know, and God, God's the same way. He heard you the first time. We don't have to keep repeating it. He knows exactly what you've already asked for. Sometimes he, he just is waiting. And sometimes the, the results won't come for years later. Spurgeon said, prayer are measured by weight and not by length. God wants our full attention when we converse with him. Jesus is not, of course, forbidding long prayer. He himself on occasion prayed all night long. And so there's nothing wrong with a long prayer. Look at verse 8. Therefore, do not be like them. So don't be like these hypocrites. Your father knows things you have need of before you even ask for them. God is omniscient. He knows all things. He knows what you have need of. So don't be long. Just ask and he will provide for you what you need. The Jews were aware of his omniscience. The only thing that they struggled with was the comforting aspect of God. Uh, they knew God knew all things, but they were very cold in that. And, and Jesus here is, is sharing with us something. He's sharing about a God who is a father here. Now, we're not to connect with the Lord to inform him. We're to connect to the Lord to submit to his will. Adam Clark said, prayer requires more of the heart than of the tongue it's just not to inform god about what's going on because he already knows he already knows it's it's to ask and and then to receive uh, his will for our lives let's move on now we come to the model prayer which we call the lord's prayer and I think we all know the Lord's Prayer, right? 1800s, they wrote a song about it, and pretty much everybody knows the Lord's Prayer. If you grew up in, in the United States, most people are uh, Catholic or come from Catholicism, and so you've learned to recite the Lord's Prayer. And we can all recite it because we were drilled with it. You know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. And, you know, all of this stuff. Give us our daily bread as we, and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass. You know, we just, it's just been breaded in us. And so we just know that prayer. But it has become a repetitive prayer for many. It's become a prayer that Jesus would uh, teach against in repeating vainly. Uh, Jesus wants this prayer to be more than just a repeated prayer. He wants it to be a model or an outline on how we pray. So he says in verse 9, in this manner or like this, don't just say it like this. I want you to do it like this. Therefore, pray. Now, it's interesting. The word pray there is in the present imperative, meaning pray uh, to a habitual practice. And so don't just be one prayer, but practice praying constantly, but not in vain. And he says, our Father in heaven luke says father in his recite of the lord's prayer he just says father the jewish people rarely address god as father in first chronicles 29 david said blessed are you lord god of israel our father and that's david who had a deep relationship with god but boy you rarely called god father that speaks of intimacy there and yet jesus is telling us to call him father father that's easy to understand today and we get it but put yourself back at that time and that culture when, when you feared god when god was to be reverenced uh, you remember the children of israel were all camped before the mount of sinai 
and God's Shekinah glory was there. And the people finally said to Moses, look, we're not going up there. <laughs> you know, we're staying here. You go up. We're too scared to go up. Look at that mountain. It's thundering and there's clouds and we don't want to approach God. At least we'd be consumed like uh, Balaam who, who stood against Moses, you know. Uh, and so, no, you go up there. And there was just a reverence and a fear of God himself. And so to call God Father, that was almost like, ooh, how dare we even get that close to God? And yet today we call him Father all the time. And, and Christians understand that we even call him Daddy because he's so personal in our lives. And that's wonderful. And he says, though, hallow be thy name. Hallow be thy name. Holy is his name. Reverence his name. We need to understand that he is reverence, that he is the Father of, of heaven itself. And verse 10 says, for yours kingdom come. Your kingdom come. A reference to possibly eschatology the end times we're hoping that your kingdom will come the the focus will be that as your kingdom comes we will all worship you from that point on your will be done on earth as it is in heaven again eschatologically speaking in heaven the Lord of the will is done perfectly. All things are complete and pure and holy. And it would be wonderful to have those things on heaven also. I mean, on earth also. Wouldn't it be nice to have a little heaven on earth? That would be beautiful uh, to see humanity change just a little bit. And so a part of our prayers to pray for humanity. Uh, pray for the Lord's will to be done on this earth as it is in heaven. There's nothing wrong with that. Again, he's giving us an outline here. He's giving us a starting point to, to, sh to spring forward from that. So pray for the earth. Pray for the people on the earth. And pray that they become more heavenly minded and not so earthly minded as many are. And then verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. The people of Galilee were very poor. They didn't have a lot. They were oppressed. And, and so as he was sharing with them uh, about prayer, pray for your daily food because it is your Father in heaven who gives you that daily food. It, it's not provided by your own strength and your own resources. It's provided by God. And that's a struggle that so many men have is they think that uh, they're working and they're providing and, and, and having to work with longer and stronger hours is going to continue to keep them above water. And that's just not true. I have seen men give their lives, pour their lives into companies and corporations for many, many years. And, and just because their usefulness is done with it, they let you go and say, sorry, it's just business. It's just business. And they poured and they give and they took as much as they could. But when it comes to, down to it, it's God who provides. Boy, I wish we would learn that. This church would be more prosperous if, if people would give what, what God has given to them. This prayer reflects the real need of people living in difficult time. And so he says, give us, give us, asking God for that gift, asking God uh, to supply their, their every need. I mean, you see the picture in the Old Testament of the manna falling from the sky, right? And they didn't do anything. All God said was, look, it's going to come down every day. You go out and you pick up what you want and you need and, and eat it and so forth. Just on the seventh day, let it rest. Don't touch it. That day set, separated unto, unto me. We need to trust in him for our daily supplies. It goes on in verse 12. And forgive us our debts. Forgive means to send away or, or to dismiss, Lord. Uh, we have sinned and we need forgiveness. And so forgive us our debts. And sin can be debts. Uh, we owe God. The wages of sin is death. And we want forgiveness for that. How forgiving is God? God is so forgiving. It's just amazing um, if we were just to contemplate that. I encourage you to do that today. Think about how forgiving God is just to you, just to you. L listen to what the psalmist said. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. Imagine the sins that we've committed that nobody even knows, and yet God hasn't dealt with us on those sins. Oh, you've hidden them from others. Oh, and you think, oh, I got away with that one. God hasn't dealt with it. He hasn't dealt with it. He is so gracious. He says, nor punish us according to our iniquities. Those are the willful sinning. We willfully are doing things. We willfully have a wrong heart. We willfully don't forgive. We willfully fight against. We willfully don't support him. We willfully don't give him his 10th percent. And yet he pardons them. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great 
is his mercies towards those who fear him. His mercies are great upon us. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. Now he relates our relationship with God as a father to children. How great a father's love is for their children here on this earth. And when their children sin, they don't take out the trash, they don't make their bed, they don't do what they're supposed to do. And yet the father has compassion and pity and forgives them over and over and over again. When they're not honoring, when they're not respecting their fathers. And there is no condition on that at all. They're your father, they're your mother, you're to honor them, period. And yet they love you and they're patient and they wait. And that's an earthly father. And you remember Jesus said, and if your earthly father can do that, how much more will your father in heaven give you? Pretty awesome, the God we serve. He is a forgiving God. And he says, as we forgive our debtors, woo, the word we is emphatic again. And so Jesus is saying, as we, when you pray this, say, as we forgive our debtors. Now, this is an interesting statement. You can take a couple of ways. You can go, okay, so how forgiving am I? <laughs> if I'm pretty forgiving, then whew, okay, God, you're going to really forgive me a lot too. But if I'm not forgiving, God isn't going to be forgiving. If you can't forgive that one thing that just has you, has your pride and you're just not going to give it up, God isn't going to forgive you. That's interesting. Or is Jesus saying, because you are a Christian, because you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you seek God with all your heart and you know how forgiving God is, how much he has forgiven you, you'll forgive others too. You'll forgive others too. Because you might even be worse than others and yet God forgave you. And so the implication here is, is that as believers, you know you need to forgive and you just to walk in forgiveness. And as you walk in forgiveness and forgive, God forgives you of all the things you've done. And do not lead us into temptation or fiery trials, Lord, as part of the prayer there. Don't lead us into those trials that will test us and, and overcome us, but be with us in a sense as we go through these trials because these trials are necessary for growth. They're important. Little humor here. A minister parked his car in a no parking zone in a large city because he had a short time and couldn't find a space for a meter. So he put a note on his windshield wiper that read, I have circled the block 10 times and if I don't park here, I'm going to miss my appointment. Forgive us our transgressions. So as he returned back, he found this little citation from a police officer along along with a note, and it said, I've circled the block 10 years, and if I didn't give you a ticket, I would lose my job, so lead us not into temptation. <laughs> uh, but deliver us from the evil one, or from evil, and they go together, right? Oh boy, we need to pray for that, that God would deliver us from the evil one and from evil. God can only do that, in fact. We can't do it. Try to stop doing something that you're doing and you know you shouldn't be doing it. Just try. It's hard. It's difficult to just stop it. Stop that characteristic. Stop that sinful nature. The nature is with you wherever you go. And so we need to pray, Lord, help us from this evil. Help us from the evil one who has us. For yours is the kingdom. In other words, you rule, Lord. Uh, and the power and the glory forever and ever. And amen. It is so. It is true. We can take that to the bank and deposit it. That you are the God of heaven and earth. The word amen. I love that word amen. Because it's uh, interpreted as um, amen in any language. So when you say it in Spanish, it's amen. When you say it in Japanese, it's amen. Or in Portuguese, amen. Doesn't matter what language it is. Amen. 
And so it's amen when it comes to the Lord. Then he goes on in verse 14 in the last two verses. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So he radiates or repeats what he said in the Lord's prayer there, reminding them, that not just forgiveness of sins, but reckless sins. That word transgression means willful sin or even indicates a recklessness with sin, that your Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now let me close with that. Jesus is saying that to fail to forgive others is to demonstrate that a person has not felt the saving touch of God anyway. Okay, so if you can't forgive someone, it's because you really don't understand the grace of God and his forgiveness. Now, there's a prayer that every man should pray. We will all be challenged. Every human being will be challenged with this at one point in their life, whether young, middle-aged, or adult. Every human being will have this challenge where God will reveal himself to them and they will have to make a choice to choose him or to reject him. Every man. Because God is a just God. He's fair. And when you stand before him and he says, did you know my son Jesus Christ? And you go, no. Because I didn't have the opportunity. He goes, no, no, no. I gave you the opportunity. So you're here this morning and you have an opportunity this morning. You won't stand before God saying, I didn't have the opportunity. What is that prayer? It's the prayer of a sinner who realizes that he falls short of the glory of God. He realizes that he has sinned and he has not asked God for forgiveness. And God wants and requires an asking of forgiveness because he loves you He wants to forgive you. In fact, the debt's already paid for. He paid for it at the cross. It's done. He just wants you to take it now, that forgiveness, by a simple prayer. Romans is very, very clear in Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And so he wants a confession from you. He wants a prayer. So let's bow our heads. And if you haven't prayed this prayer, a a sinner's prayer, we call it, a prayer of repentance, a prayer that says, I need God in my life and I need to live for God. I want you to pray this prayer right now with me. Say, Lord, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he came and died to pay the penalty for the sins I committed. I ask you forgive me, to give me the gift of eternal life. You promised it to me. Come into my life and give me a new beginning with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.